Welcome everyone to our Archaeology Cafe. So shifting now to tonight's uh, opportunity to spend some time with Marin Hopkins of Anthropological Research LLC. Uh, Marin was a, uh, an archaeologist when I first met her. I saw her down on the border uh, on a project that was uh, a major excavation and very soon after that, she entered the U of A program, their uh, applied anthropology program, and worked with T.J. Ferguson, and now is, for I guess five years or so, has been an employee with Anthropological Research, LLC. She's been working with us on our Great Bend of the Gila project, and I want to turn the floor over to Marin to share things uh, about her experience of working with Native communities and uh, kind of a landscape view of that relationship. So, Marin, thank you for coming in tonight. Thanks. Okay. okay. I think I'm standing right where they told me not to stand, so I'm going to scoot over now that Phil has introduced me. Uh, I just want to thank Archaeology Southwest for inviting me here. And um, this came up months ago, and they said, Marin, would you come and talk about collaborative research with Native communities? And so... Here we are in April, and I had to go back and read what I said I would say. Um, and so hopefully I don't disappoint. But I, I wanted to um, come and talk to you guys about the work that I do, which is um, I do research that deals with traditional cultural practices um, that are associated with the land uh, for Native communities. Um, and so that covers a really broad spectrum of, of work. Um, and so I'm going to go through the types of work that I do, how I do it, and then I'll give you an example. I made this handout. I hope you all have a copy. Um, it's my crutch. So I was told I couldn't have a PowerPoint. I was like, oh, no, what should I do? Um, so uh, I want to go through this, and then I'm really interested to hear what you all have to say or what you're interested in, in knowing, if anything. Um, and so that's sort of where I'm going with this. So I do work with several tribes um, across the Southwest. Um, I'm pretty active with the Hopi tribe, uh, the Pueblo of Zuni, the Autumn, the, all of the four Southern tribes, um, and several others. And a lot of the work that I do deals with um, compliance with federal, dealing with compliance issues on federal land. Um, and so I'll give you a little bit of background on what that means for those of you who may not understand what compliance work on federal land means for tribes. Um, but we also get to do a lot of really fun stuff with the National Park Service and with places like Archaeology Southwest and with archaeologists to answer questions and to help enable um, interactions between researchers and tribes um, so that people can come to a better understanding about tribal knowledge and about history of land use by different cultural groups. So I have my little paper here. There's 22 tribes in Arizona alone. Um, and it comprises almost 30% of the land in Arizona. And if you look in between all the reservations, you have a whole lot of federal land, and you have a little bit of private land, and you have some state land in there. and so. If you're a federal agency, you have to comply with the law. Uh, you're supposed to, anyway. And so one of those laws is the National Historic Preservation Act, which really drives a lot of the work that I do. And the National Environmental Policy Act drives a lot of the work that I do. Um, the reason is, is both of those laws have um, sections in them that require federal agencies to understand historic properties and cultural resources uh, that are important to tribal communities. And so if I'm, for example, um, ADOT, a state agency, and I want to build a road, I can't just go and plow through the land. I need to talk to people. I need to identify what's there. I need to figure out what's important. Um, and so the agencies talk to the tribes. And I am a researcher who works on behalf of the tribes to help them translate their concerns into the framework of these laws. Everybody following me? Um, good. 
So the cool thing about working with tribes is that they've been here for a long time and we can learn a lot from them. And they have a lot of really deep connections to, to the land um, that are still alive today. So the way this works is I need to identify places that are important to them and understand why they're important and be able to make a convincing argument to federal agencies or state agencies or whomever um, that these places need consideration before the work can go forward. So that's, uh, so how do I do that? We, people understand tribal history. A lot of people say or, oral history or oral tradition. That's how tribes remember their, their history and their knowledge. And so it should be easy to go and say, hey, tell me about your history. Let's understand it. Um, and it's never that easy because the stories and the, the oral history don't come together quite that way. And so one of the ways that we operate when we work with tribes to understand these places is that we, we really believe in taking them to the place because places bring out a lot of memories and a lot of connections and a lot of thoughts. Um, and it's a comfortable environment to start talking about what's important. You look at the plants and you're like, that plant is something that I use in a certain ceremony. That plant's something that my grandmother uses as a medicine. And so being in, in the landscape and in the environment is really important for our work. It's, it's not really my job to come up with the questions. Like, I understand the what the project is, is about. I understand that ADOT wants to build a road, but it's not my job to come up with the questions. So we rely on collaboration with tribes and we rely on, on their knowledge and their interests to be able to understand why things are important. And so generally I don't, in these compliance related situations, I don't go to them and say, hey, we're gonna study this and this and this, it's more organic than that, and it's more a grassroots process that we need to say, hey, what's important about this place and why? Um, because I don't know their history unless I talk to them about it. So, um, so traditional history, I wanna talk a little bit about oral history. Um, oral history is really important, and people love to understand oral history but history is expressed in a lot of different ways, um, including in ceremony and rituals and in the daily material expressions, including archaeology. Um, and I'll get into that, an example of that, so that makes a little bit more sense to you when we turn the page over. So um, it's not just about oral transmission of knowledge. There's a lot of ways of understanding knowledge, and there's a lot of ways of uh, interpreting that and so it's really useful to go beyond oral history and think about traditional history in the sense that history manifests in, in different ways and on that note history when it's manifested in living communities it's more than just history it's part of the living environment it's part of the living people today who still retain things that they inherited from the past and then my final note on the top portion is the transmission of knowledge. So I want to go talk to the Hopi about a place that's important to them. And I can say, tell me why this place is important. And they, they might say, well, I heard this story about a guy who traveled down the Colorado River. And this is my segue into my, the back of my page. And it's really great for Hobie because we understand our values and we understand what's important about life and we um, understand the environment that way. And I might go to another Hobie and I say, uh, tell me why this place is important. I heard this story that this guy traveled down the Colorado River. What do you know about that? Well, that's the origins of my clan. And so there we have another layer of history beyond this cool kid who was really brave went down the Colorado River. That's my clan history, and that's where I come from. Um, and so I could go to another Hopi person. I could say, tell me about this story. And they might say, I don't know anything about that story. You can't talk to me about that. Go talk to so-and-so. Um, and then I can talk to another person, and they say, 
oh yeah, this happened, and they'll go into an elaborate hours-long story about um, this boy who traveled down the Colorado River, and all of these things happen, and now today they're wearing parts of that story on their kilts during the snake dance. Um, so that's sort of where I'm going with these layers of knowledge. Not everyone is entitled to all the information. Not everyone is, knows the information. And stories mean different things to different people based on who you are. Um, and Hopi is not the only tribe that, where layers of knowledge and, and ways of knowing things apply. Um, a lot of tribes and a lot of us, I could say, tell me about physics, and I would be like, I have no idea. <laughs> Go talk to so-and-so. And so there's, a, you know, education plays into it. Um, religion plays into it. There's a lot of things. I'm not an expert on most things at all. Um, and so layers of knowledge, I think, we, it's something we take for granted, and it's something that should be understood and applied to, to, all, to all of us, really. Um, and so... I want to shift from kind of talking in the abstract to giving you kind of a concrete example. So if you turn over my paper, um, this is an example from Hopi uh, of the story that I made reference to. Um, we did a project several years ago in Glen Canyon, Lake Powell. Uh, I'm sure some of you have probably been there. And our job was to understand why this landscape is important to the Hopi people. And so we're f it was a really fun project because Lake Powell's hard to access by car, so the Park Service gave us their plane, and we got to go flying around, and we got to go driving around in boats and stuff. It was really great. But uh, we flew over this mountain. And uh, do any of you know what that mountain is? I'm sure you've been there before. <laughs> Um, some people call it Navajo Mountain. <laughs> the Hopis call it Tokonavi. They have a place name for it, and it's a name that goes way back in, in their history. And so we're driving around with this group of Hopis, and they say, oh, that's Tokonavi. Some people call it Navajo Mountain, but that's not its name. It's Tokonavi. Um, and so we said, well, tell us about this mountain. Why, do you, why does it have a Hopi name? What do you know about it? Oh, that belongs to the rattlesnake people. Um, and you're like, okay, cool. We'll have to follow up on that and see what that means. And then we're standing in this part, Horseshoe Bend. Some of you may have been there looking at the Colorado River. And we're working with Hopi advisors. And they say, that boy, he took a log down the Colorado River a long time ago. And he went all the way to Mexico. Um, okay. Who's this boy? I don't know, but he found a wife down there. Okay. <laughs> so what can you tell me about that? Well, I'm not from that clan, so I can't tell you anything about it. And we're like, oh, man, it was just getting good. So, so in Hopi, clan knowledge is really, it's not the job of other clans to speak the histories of clans that aren't theirs. So we finally are able to talk to people who are from that clan, and we say, can you tell us the story of, of this boy that I've been hearing about who traveled down the Colorado River? And they said, yeah, he, he went down there because he was curious. He had to go down the river. He knew there was something there for him. And at that time in history, there was a drought. Um, his people were living around Tokonavi, and at that time they... They were so and such and such people who were living there. And so he went down and he was guided by Spider Woman, who's a deity who helps people kind of like a spiritual guide who helps people kind of along their route. Um, and he ended up on the land and there were all these snakes all over. And then the snake people invited him into their kiva and they were trying to trick him, but Spider Woman was there to help him. Uh, and so Tio, the boy's name is, that's the name for boy in Hopi, he had the help of his spiritual guardian. And these snake people way down there at the end of the river when it meets the ocean and that land that's down there that we know is Mexico, um, told him, 
come on into our kiva, and they tried to fool him, and he, he was able to kind of surpass all of their trials. And as a result, he was awarded with a wife, a, a maiden, um, and that maiden then traveled back to, to Konavi with him, and, and thus the rattlesnake clan of Hopi. And so when he got back there, um, they didn't have the discipline to know really how to interact with society. And as the story goes, the snake babies bit people and people started dying. They had the ability to bring rain. That was the power that Tio brought back. They, they could bring rain. But they didn't teach their children well. <laughs> you know, they, they started biting people and the people finally said, you know, you gotta go. And so they had a deity who was a plumed serpent who represents that clan, who lived in a cave on Tokonavi, and he flew away and they followed him. And so all of this information, I could go on and on about the rest of the story, but the, this information is all comes out when people visit this place and when they see this mountain and when they see the river, and it brings out a lot of history and it brings out a lot of connection that's still very much a part of Hopi life today. Um, so then we go, we've been having these conversations and we go to a petroglyph panel kind of way on the other side of Lake Powell and there's these two petroglyphs and people say, you know, that looks a lot like that plumed dragon deity, that plumed serpent deity and it's in the territory of the snake people and the rattlesnake clan are warriors traditionally at Hopi and it makes sense that this is a in the minds of the Hopi people when they go there today, their history that they know makes sense when they see it on the land. Um, so that's pretty cool, I think. Um, in the upper quadrant of this paper, you see a mural. Has anyone ever visited this place besides TJ? <laughs> he took this photo, I should credit him for that. but. Um, it's a desert view tower at the Grand Canyon, and it was painted, I think, in 1933 by Fred Cabote, who's a, a Hopi um, member of the Bluebird clan. He's now passed, but Mary Coulter, way back then, asked him to come to the Grand Canyon. He was an artist um, and asked him to make Hopi art in this Hopi house, Grand, you know, desert view tower. And this is one of the paintings that he drew. And if you look at it, going from the top right, going counterclockwise, it tells the story of Tio. He gets in his log and he goes down the river and then he meets the snake people. He gets his wife and then they, they're all happy and they become the rattlesnake clan and they come back to the Southwest. Um, and so Fred Cabote, when he's asked to make a painting in the Grand Canyon, this is the story that comes to mind because it's a connection to place. It's a connection to history and it's manifested now through art. What, what we Westerners call art. Um, so, and then again, my final example. And here again, we're talking about layers of knowledge. I interview a person who's from the Rattlesnake Clan. I interview a lot of people and I'm like, tell me this story, it's such a good story. I don't know, I'm not from the Rattlesnake Clan. He's a cool kid, he taught us a lot, he's brave, that's what we got from it. That's the layer of knowledge that they're, they know and that they're willing to share. Um, and then other people you talk to, that's my clan, that's my clan origins, and this is the story. And then now, if you go to Hopi and you are able to see the, rattles, the snake dance, uh, they wear these kilts. And this is another layer of knowledge that's now manifested not orally and not through storytelling, but on the kilts of the Hopi people. You have your snake in that little triangle that's on there. I was told that that's the footprint of the deity, the plume serpent dragon deity that is um, commemorated on the kilts of the people. It's the, it's the way that they remember that in their dance. And I've never been able to see the snake dance, and I'm okay with that, but it's um, the way the ceremony plays out. There's all this stuff going on, including a boy encountering his maiden, you know, and so the history is told through the ceremony. 
Um, and so basically, that's the kind of information that, that I like to learn and that really helps my work is because when I'm asked by ADOT, for example, before they plow a road or by a copper mine or a coal mine or anyone uh, before they're able to do something, I have, I have two, two jobs. I have to understand the place and I have to understand the tradition. And then I have to put those together to make an argument of why this place is so meaningful to the Hopi people and remembering and commemorating and, and understanding their history and why it's not just history, but it is part of the lives of people who still exist today. Um, and so that's what I, that's my example. And compliance is, is a lot of the work that I do, but I also do a lot of other projects that, like the Park Service hosts projects that are for interpretation. And so there's no, nothing threatened, really. You know, there's nothing that's at stake. It's we want to learn about this land. We want to hear what you have to say about it because we want to be able to understand it and teach people um, from the perspective of of people who have been on this land for thousands of years and who've re who've acquired and retained a lot of knowledge from that. Um, I'm working on a project right now with Archaeology Southwest for the Great Bend of the Gila, and that involves. Again, it's place-based. If you turn back over to this map, you see tribes. Believe it or not, reservations didn't always exist. So if you go beyond these boundaries, um, a lot of history has happened in between those lines for those people. And so the Great Bend of the Gila, it's an area along the middle to lower Gila River. Um, there's 13 or more tribes that have connections through, through history, through traditions through knowledge uh, to that place. And so we're trying to understand why that's meaningful so that, so that, so that the tribes themselves can reconnect to that place and, and have their knowledge and understanding um, sort of validated in, in talking about it and in being able to visit those places. And because it's beneficial for those of us archeologists or land managers who work on these lands and want to make sure that we make sensitive and appropriate decisions for the people that, that have history and, and connections to these places. So the big theme is history and living people. And there's an arc there that it's, it's not something of the past. It's something that people get from the past that continues to influence their lives today. And so that's really sort of what, what I try to accomplish in the projects that I do is, is that it's, it's not just something of the past, it's heritage, something that's inherited from the past that continues to influence people today. And people are really concerned about their children and who's coming next. And they don't want to just forget where they came from. They want to be able to pass that information along. So um, I have lots of examples. I could keep talking. but. Um, this is obviously beneficial to the tribes in some ways. It might not be in the, in the life way or tradition of tribes to open up and share all this stuff. But, but the fact is, is that tribes now live on reservations and their access to places has become limited. And in opening up and participating and in sharing this information, they get to go back and remember these stories. And then they get to go home and they get to talk about them. And their children get to hear these stories and they get to continue that tradition of, of sharing their knowledge about the land and the history. I think scholars benefit, I think archeologists benefit because we're always looking for questions to ask, you know, when we're dealing with the material record. Um, and so when archeologists talk to tribes and talk to knowledgeable people about their history, new questions come up and it sends us in new directions for, for inquiry. Um, and it also helps us to understand what we're dealing with in, in different ways that maybe me, a non autumn might never have thought of myself. And then we get to share that with the tribes and they get, it becomes this kind of synergy that works in all directions. Um, benefits to land managers, well, they have to comply with the law, so that's a good benefit. But then when land managers start to understand the lands that they're 
required to manage. They can interpret it better. They can manage it better. They can avoid places. They can um, make appropriate interpretations. They can close off an area that's maybe not appropriate for people to visit because it's a highly spiritual area for tribes. Uh, so it's beneficial to land managers in that way. And we all work together, believe it or not, you know. And so, you know, when people start to, to get information, then we start sharing it amongst each other, including the tribes and including the archaeologists, including the land managers. So it creates a new direction for communication. And then benefits to everyone because we share information, we talk about ideas. Tribe, tribal people don't, they're not always in tune with what's going on with archaeology. But a lot of times, there's things that archaeologists are studying that are really interesting. And, and they can say, whoa, this is cool. Like, I've heard this. And, and now you're understanding this. And so people really benefit in all areas. And I think um, it's important to talk to people about their history, about who they are, instead of talk about, about them. It's important to talk to them. So. I think that's more or less my spiel. I don't know if I like flew through that, but I don't know. Uh, I'm really interested to hear what you guys have to say, and I have a lot of other things I could talk about, but uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. And I will bring you the microphone and just put your hand up, and I see Jack right there. We'll be right over. Okay. And uh, we're recording this, for, uh, so that's why we want the microphone. Descriptions you've made, the, your communications, your discussions with these various Native American um, sound, have sounded casual. Okay. Um, have you made an effort or is an effort allowed, cultural sensitivity, I'm not sure, but I'd be interested in how you might have documented the content of these conversations so that there was some kind of a database or a way to look at it post-conversational mm -hmm. to compare with I'd be interested in how you documented those conversations, if at all. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, this is casual here. I should say that. This is casual. Uh, the work that I do is, is we follow pretty serious protocols, and it's always done for a purpose, pretty much. And so um, we take lots of notes, and we also conduct oral interviews that use audio recording, and then transcriptions are made following the audio. And all of those things are curated with the tribe that we're working with. And the tribe is the one who gets to make the decision who has access to their knowledge. Some of the things we talk about are pretty sensitive. There's a real trust relationship that exists between people like myself and, and the people that I work with. And not all of it ends up in the report that I write. You know, it goes through review processes and it goes through uh, layers of review and, you know, because sometimes they tell me things that aren't, aren't really meant for, for the purpose that we're trying to, to get at. Um, and so it's, I would say it's really well documented. The things that weren't meant to be communicated beyond, were they extra uh, subject-wise, or are they deeper within a more mythical or... So, for example, um, if I'm trying to understand a historic property, and I'm speaking to the language of the National Historic Preservation Act, Section 106, requires federal agencies to identify and assess and mitigate the effect of their project on these historic properties. And so, so for example, Native American traditional cultural places, as it's stated under this law, um, they're not required to share everything about their knowledge of that place. They're required to share enough that they can make that argument. And so sometimes there's a lot of sharing that goes on, but they don't need, they don't, it's, they don't need to do that to meet their needs, their purpose of the project. Uh, and it, it, you know, it's, for example, it's like if I said, tell me what you believe in. And I, I sat down and I asked you, tell me what you believe in. That's kind of a big question. And I'm, like, I don't know. I don't know you, you know. I don't want to tell you what I believe in. So it, think about it in that way, I guess, you know. And there is a need and there's a desire to protect places and to have access to places. But there's sensitivities involved with that, too. So you just talked about asking these big questions and trust 
And I'm curious, how much time do you spend <laughs> in the location with people? What's, what's that process like? Well, it depends on the project, really. Um, but for some of the tribes I've worked with, I've spent quite a bit of time with, in the community and with the people that, that I work with. And I've also had really good teachers and mentors who've introduced me to that, who have their own lineage in that place. And so that you know, trust kind of gets passed along. Um, and so it takes time sometimes to, for, for people to get an understanding and a feel for who I am and, and for me to even understand what I'm supposed to be asking um, and why. Um, <laughs> cumulatively, I've spent years of my life in different places, but I don't know if that really answers your question. But I've worked, for example, like at Hopi, I've worked on numerous projects over time, and so, you, so I, I, know, I know the people that I'm working with, and, and they know me, and I'm sure they talk about me to their friends, you know, whatever. <laughs> so I'll, I'll let TJ go first, oh, though. No. <laughs> What's your Hopi name? Oh, man. Um, Polisi. Polisi, and I can't translate because that will be giving away too much information about myself. So <laughs> It means Primrose, which is actually my middle name. It's actually my middle name. So. And then my real question is a two-part question, which is uh, what do you like most about your job and what do you like least about your job? Um... Well, I, I guess what I, that's a big question, TJ. Uh, I think there's like endless information out there. And I think when you're sitting face to face with people, the things that they say and the way that they express them, and when you see them expressed in so many different ways on the land and through ceremony and through art, um, it's information that we really need to consider and, and take seriously because it's what these people are about, you know? And so I learn something all the time and I really sort of thrive off of that. And if I was still an archeologist, I, I know, uh, I still like to identify as an archeologist, but I don't deal with the dirt as much as I used to. There's lots of questions that come up. So I get really excited to share that with my friends who, who do deal with the dirt, you know? Um, and then what I like least about my job, <laughs> I, I don't really dislike my job, I have to say, but uh, I like it, but it's hard work. And I think it's kind of challenging and intimidating sometimes to listen to what people have to say and then know that I have the responsibility to essentially translate that into a way that's meaningful for the purpose that, that we're trying to accomplish. It's hard, it's hard to do that sometimes and have the meaning be passed along in the way that it should. So. It's, it's not really what I like least about my job, but it is hard and intimidating to be able to try to do that. Let your colleagues ask questions here. Oh boy, I've done lots of work with Aaron. He should be sitting up here. Hi, Aaron. <laughs> um, so archeologists and anthropologists have been crafting histories about tribal people for over a century now. Mm -hmm. And tribal people, as you related, share their history orally and through traditions and practices. The type of work you do, uh, basically implies or results in these tribal histories being pinned. And so these oral histories are now working into a uh, written text. Mm -hmm. How, from, your, from working with the tribes, how do they perceive that process? Well, I think tribes understand that, you know, I think people need to understand like tribes aren't these static things things that exist like the way they looked a thousand years ago. Like they don't look that way anymore today. There's people who are living in modern society with the rest of us who have modern concerns. They speak English and Hopi and they understand our culture and theirs. Um, and I think that there's a need to be able, <coughs> things are changing. They're, they're always changing, right? Um, there's a need basically in the sense that the land looks really different than it used to. And the less access you have to places, the less you're going to talk about them and the less you're going to be able to share. And so there's that need to be able to document that. Um, 
and there's a there's a concern for future generations to be able to understand who they are and where they came from and that might only happen through written documents so that's one um, and there's also big concerns about what's happening with the land mines roads solar panels you name it there's from the value and the you know belief system of a tribe that's not their way and so they it's something that they want to speak to because it's they have concerns about what's going on on a given landscape where they have history and traditional connections um, so I think those those are parts of it having said that I might be taking all my notes and writing these reports it's still not open access to everyone out there who wants it. Just because it's written down doesn't mean that you can have it. You need to go through the protocols of the tribe and you need to make an argument of why you deserve that knowledge and what you're going to do with it and then engage in that kind of communication and um, to be able to use the information that, that they consider to be important. So, It sounds like your job is amazing <laughs> and way fun. And I can't understand how you could come from graduating to a university to all of a sudden you're friends with Hopis <laughs> and Tohono Odoms. Is this a position that has been? And like, how did you get there? And the, the second part I would like to know is how much of the petrogra pictographs and petroglyphs they've interpreted for you? So I'll answer the second part of that question first. Okay. Yeah, if that's OK with you. And. Um, so when we have a project, usually we'll pick a sample of places that we want to understand. And we'll try to, let's say we're, we're asked to talk about Hopi traditions in Glen Canyon. It's pretty big. It's like a couple million acres of land. A lot of it's covered with a lake now. But um, so we need, it's my job to figure out what's kind of a representative sample that will get us a, a big, broad understanding of that place because ultimately that's what the Park Service needs to know. And we don't want to go out in the field and just focus on this over here and forget about that, because that wouldn't really s do justice to, to the Hopi traditions and knowledge in that area, for example. So it's my job to kind of figure it out as the methodology before we go out there and decide where are we going to visit. Um, archaeologists have been working for a long time on understanding styles and traditions and and so we use that information in being able to communicate with the tribes. Archaeology is important to tribes, so we, we want to use that information and talk to them about that. Um, <laughs> yeah. You have a picture here that has, has glyphs mm -hmm. with the three men fighting. So what's, what's the story behind that? I've seen that a number of times. Yeah, you've seen this a number of times because this is at Defiance House, which is a, one of the interpretive sites at Glen Canyon. And so it's a place people can visit. Uh, we also went to a lot of other sites that people don't generally visit. But there were like thousands of sites in Glen Canyon before Lake Powell inundated the canyons. And so there's part of it is like what's left to look at. We also went through a lot of the documents and the archaeological history, and we, we, I created a portfolio that we could look at for stuff that's no longer there. But it doesn't mean that the history is not there. Um, and so that's something that we do sometimes. We are currently involved as a, a next phase to this project, Glen Canyon. The National Park Service funded, us, uh, funded a collection study. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with the history of Glen Canyon, but the Bureau of Reclamation decided to build a dam on the Colorado River. And, and in doing so, a lot of stuff was inundated. Um, there's several thousand sites that, were, that work was done at prior to that um, by the University of Utah and the Museum of Northern Arizona. They were hired to go in and do the archaeological work before inundation. And so if you go to the Natural History Museum of Utah, those collections are all there. You're missing the context in the sense that you, don't, you can't stand at that site and look at it. But the Hopis know where Glen Canyon is. They understand the, the landscape. And so looking at those artifacts is still meaningful in that, in that sense. Um, so there's a lot. That's an example where we don't, you know, I don't work with lakes all the time where I have to deal with that issue. But 
it's really sort of a methodological question of how do I decide where we should go that's going to be able to give us an understanding of what this place is about. So, what's that? I sometimes I organize the projects. Yeah, yeah. So what's your job title? I mean, I just <laughs> I, 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 somehow I just can't because I can't. Go I'm up shy. To, Come I, on. I, I can't. I can't imagine going up to the Hopi Reservation and just stopping and say, "Hey, would you take a walk with me and let tell me stories about the neighborhood?" Uh, Is there an and again, person who has to talk to you? On well, day? that's a good point. Um, so I again, like I inherited my position from people who have worked for years there and so I didn't just show up like I was introduced and I you know have spent some time there to create a relation relationships um, but I didn't do that on my own and we we can't do that on our own you know um, the other thing I think that your question the point that it speaks to is is protocols again tribes have offices and they have entities that, that represent their cultural affairs. So at Hopi, for example, the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office is, the, is a place that you need to go if you want to initiate a question about Hopi culture. And you should go there. You need to go there. And you can get online and look at their protocols. You need to go there. And you need to talk to them. And you need to say, hey, I'm interested in understanding this and this and this. Uh, they might tell you to get lost. I don't know, but they might say that's interesting and they might give you insight on how to answer your question. Um, other tribes have similar offices. Um, and really that's the way that tribes are organized today in today's world. They're the ones who are the voice on cultural matters and, and thus the people that I work with. Um, and so they might tell me to talk to so-and-so but I don't go and knock on so-and-so's door by myself. I need to create that kind of formal connection, yeah. So earlier on, you mentioned the term mitigation. Yeah. And so as archaeologists, we've kind of developed an idea that if there's an archaeological site that's going to have a road going through it, there's excavating and, and going through a process results in minimizing or reducing those impacts and it's a it's a fairly standardized process but for let's just use a, a simple small um, thing on the ground which might be say a, a shrine okay um, and a road is going to go through that are there ways to quote mitigate the loss of a shrine or something analogous to that and as there, has there been have tribes, I mean, in my observations, I think new tribal responses to construction projects, reburial ceremonies, I don't think were traditional um, things in the distant past, and mm -hmm. they've developed new approaches uh, as um, relationships between archaeologists and, and Native Americans and laws uh, advanced. But how does one deal with the mitigation issue. That's the really tough one that I see in, in dealing with tribal issues. And I'm just I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Oh, that's I'm okay. just curious how, how that issue gets addressed. So my job is mainly about identification and making recommendations. And um, I personally haven't dealt with mitigation for these types of places. But for those of you who are familiar with archaeological language and compliance work, the standard sentence that we write in reports is avoidance. If avoidance isn't possible, then data recovery. Um, and tribes don't write the second half to that sentence. Avoidance is usually their preferred method of mitigation. If avoidance isn't possible, then the agency needs to engage in formal government-to-government -government consultation, which is beyond my scope of work, to talk about what you know, it just gets the agency and it gets the tribe together to talk more about about these things. But I really deal with the identification part of it. Um, so I don't want to get into that too much because that's not within my experience. But I do know in cases, and I don't know if this is compliance related, but people have made videos and, you know, in, as ways to show and represent the environment through, through videos. Um, 
excavation isn't the preferred method. You know, if avoidance isn't possible, excavation is not the preferred method in my experience. And so I think, I think the government to government consultation where they can sit down and, and, and talk about what to do next and understand the severity of the loss for the tribes face to face. I think that's an important step in the process. Very helpful answer, thank you. Are there other, other questions in the back, anywhere? Well, Marin, you did a great job. Thank you very much. <laughs> and just a quick reminder again.